joining us for our second broadcast of this year's Toolkits Poetry Live broadcast. Uh, I'm joining you from the Wheeler Centre based in Nam. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of this land, land that was stolen and land that has been cared for by First Nations people since time immemorial. It is important that we move across this place with great care and respect, that we recognise the knowledge of this land as First Peoples, and that we acknowledge that the violence of colonialism is ongoing. I'd also like to highlight the importance of putting action to our acknowledgements. In Nam right now, one way in which we can do this is standing behind First Nations people in the fight to protect the sacred burning trees on Jabwara country. So while I ask that each of you take a moment to acknowledge the country from which you are tuning in from, I also ask, in the words of Yoda Yoda, Jaja Warak artist Neil Morris, to not let your words be the end of your outreach. Stand with your word. So my name is Melody Coloma and I'm the facilitator of Toolkits Poetry, a program run by Express Media and Australian Poetry. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Toolkits is an online intensive 12-week program for writers under 30. It provides one-on-one -on -one mentorship to guide young writers through the development of new work, alongside a series of workshops and presentations, some of which, like this one, are broadcast live with exciting guest stars. Express Media. <laughs> <laughs> Express Media are an organisation focused on the development of young writers. They produce brilliant programs like Tracks uh, and the Masterminds Behind Voice Works, a quarterly literary journal for writers under 25. Uh, Australian Poetry is the peak body for poetry in Australia. They produce the National Festival Program as well as a suite of publications. So I'd encourage you all to get involved with both Express media and Australian poetry in any way you can and to go to their websites and subscribe to VoiceWorks and Australian Poetry Journal if you can. Toolkits is made possible by our generous funders, the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund and Toolkits Live is presented by Express Media in partnership with Regional Arts Victoria as part of the Arts Connect series funded by the Federal Government's Regional Arts Fund. So tonight we're very lucky to be joined by Jessica Wilkinson. Um, he's going to be chatting with us about non-fiction poetry. So Jess is the founding editor of Rabbit, yeah. uh, a journal for non-fiction poetry. Their first book, Marionette, a biography of Miss Marion Davies, was published by Guy in 2012 and shortlisted for the 2014 Campus Lesser Prize. The second poetic biography is for Percy Granger, was published by Vagabond in 2014. In 2014, she received a um, request traveling scholarship to research her third public biography, Music Made Visible, a biography of George Balanchine, which has just come out in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful. <laughs> um, and in 2016, she co edited Contemporary Australian Feminist Poetry, uh, published by Hunter, and she is senior lecturer in creative writing at RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, so please tweet us your questions using the hashtag and toolkits if you have them. And I'll pop back on at the end and present them to Jess. I'm going to pass over to Jess now and come back soon. Thanks, Jess. Thanks so much, Melody. And um, it's really lovely to be here um, with you all virtually. Um, <laughs> so um, just before I begin, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of this land um, uh, on which I write um, and work and play and pay my respects to their um, elders past, present um, and emerging. And that was a really lovely acknowledgement too. Um, and those trees, are, um, I grew up around that area. So um, yeah, I feel quite strongly about um, everything that's going on there at the moment. Um, so I really, I want to begin by reading a poem rather than just by talking about poems. And I've brought along um, like heaps and heaps of books, like there's a massive pile here and there's one pile here. Um, and we'll see uh, how, um, you know, if I can get through all of those tonight. Um, but yes, I want to begin by reading a poem by the late Adrian Rich called Power. 
And this poem was brought to my attention when I was a young student in my early years at university. Um, and my supervisor for my honours thesis, a really wonderful teacher by the name of Mary May Campbell, which some of you might have heard of, um, herself a wonderful poet, was particularly encouraging of my burgeoning interest in feminist poetry. So I remember she loaned me um, a copy of Rich's book, Dream of a Common Language, um, which I encourage you all to seek out. But um, before she handed it over, um, she sort of paused and she opened the book to the first poem. And I still remember this moment. Um, she was sort of electrified and couldn't refrain from reading the final lines of the poem aloud. So I'm just going to read the poem in full. And then you could probably sense my Marianne May Campbell like reading <laughs> of the final lines as well. So, power. Living in the earth deposits of our history. Today, a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth. One bottle, amber, perfect, a hundred year old cure for fever or melancholy. A tonic for living on this earth, in the winters of this climate. Today I was reading about Marie Curie. She must have known she suffered from radiation sickness. Her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and separating skin of her finger ends till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died a famous woman denying her wounds, denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. I could spend about 45 minutes um, just dissecting this poem alone and um, but I won't. <laughs> Uh, just a few things that I love. Um, I love how the poem itself, um, I don't know, I'll just hold it up there. Is that visible to everyone? I love how the poem itself is kind of cracked physically um, in the gaps within the lines and um, it's sort of separating, uh, spilling over through, you know, repetition. Um, and I also want to draw attention to those last lines, which really still resonate in my ear all those years after it was first read to me. Um, there was something about the force of those lines that I really wanted to understand um, and why um, my, this mentor of mine um, felt so compelled to, to read them aloud. Um, the line breaks and the spaces within the lines become sort of incantatory. She died, a famous woman denying her wounds, denying her wounds, came from the same source as her power. So I've been thinking about this, this poem, um, and these last lines, they kind of invoke a sort of modern day female, maybe perhaps, uh, will I go there, a sort of Christ-like figure, perhaps with some real power and strength to persist, uh, despite the awful, awful truth of her scientific endeavors. So, why am I reading this poem? This was probably the first poem with um, non-fiction content that really drew my attention to the idea of factual information beyond the mere self, um, colliding with the poetic form. So, interestingly, the poem launches from a single line, a sort of proposition um, that is, we are living in the earth deposits of our history. An idea that everything returns to the earth um, and also that we live amongst the dead or obsessed with history. So it makes me question, is it a jibe or does she say this lovingly? Who knows? We might continue this conversation afterwards. Um, we're then quickly positioned at today. We're a back home um, and we're not quite sure where this is, whether it's in her backyard, maybe she's digging a pool or maybe it's elsewhere. Maybe it's in the newspaper. It turns up this bottle, which is a tonic for living on this earth. The tone here, I think, seems quite melancholy. Um, living on this earth. 
this uh, just the other day, um, it made me just revisiting this poem. It made me look up um, what happened in 1974, which was when the poem was written. And this is something that I think a good nonfiction poem does: is it makes you curious and it makes you thirsty for more knowledge. And there's a lot going on in 1974. Obviously, it was the year of the Watergate scandal, um, Rumble in the Jungle, <laughs> uh, the Cold War was still going on, and there was a global recession. But it was also during the period of feminist activity that we know as second wave feminism. So there's probably traces of all of this turmoil in the tone of that, um, that second stanza. But also, I think, hope as she turns to a strong female figure from history, Marie Curie, um, who was a physicist and a chemist, and uh, she pioneered um, uh, radioactive uh, research into radio radioactivity. So I love how the last bit of the fifth line um, echoes now amidst climate issues uh, and following, of course, a couple of weeks ago, Greta Thunberg's UN speech. Um, a tonic for living on this earth in the winters of this climate. So moving on to the next stanza, again, Rich repeats today, the word today, and now we are in the narrator's personal space. So I think of this as Rich herself reading about Mary Curie. And the rest of the poem, the largest portion of this poem, I think <laughs> I should have prepared a PowerPoint, um, is honed on Curie's fortitude. So Rich really speculates, she contemplates, and she marvels at Curie's persistence. So by the end of the poem, we have a sense not only of Curie's dark final days, but of Rich herself gaping at the pain and the wonder of the earth, and being moved by the thought of strong women in history who died for knowledge and not for glory. Interesting also that the poem uh, ends with death, she died, a famous woman, where it started with living, living in the earth deposits of our history. Um, and I sense that in this poem, Rich is kind of saying something about living with purpose. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not going to go into that much detail with all the poems that I look at today, but in such a short poem, we can get all of that and more probably. Um, so there's a little glimpse of Curie working away to an early death from radiation sickness. There's a glimpse of Adrian Rich um, reading and contemplating a life that has purpose. There's sort of feminist resonances about strong women. Um, there's some kind of contemporary contexts possibly floating around in there of 1974. So. I guess how exciting is that, that in such a short poem you can get all of these like little bits of information and it can also make you really curious. So yes, I have this really strong memory of, um, of uh, my, a teacher reading me this poem and, um, and feeling compelled to sort of find out what is the power of this poem um, and also loving that it makes me kind of curious to find out more about Marie Curie. Okay, so I wanted to start with that poem as well because it was the poem to really sow a seed of interest for me in this idea of non-fiction poetry, which I'm going to talk to you about today. But this idea of non-fiction poetry is kind of massive because you can have many types. And when you think about it, one of the most recognisable and ubiquitous forms of poetry, the lyric I poem, um, which... Um, is probably the type of poem that you uh, read in high school or that you're most um, familiar with, where a poet writes from the first person perspective um, and expresses, expresses sort of personal emotion or feeling. Um, that is, I would say, definitely a form of non-fiction poetry, sort of autobiographical poetry. So Rich's power could be considered autobiographical uh, as much as I would say it's got biographical um, information and it's a kind of lyric poem. But when I think about non-fiction poetry more broadly, I think uh, an important question for me is what poetry can do to expand non-fiction writing. 
Um, and in part, that's why I set up the journal Rabbit, which is a journal for non-fiction poetry, um, as a platform to see how poets might respond to this provocation and to explore what poetry can do in relation to non-fiction writing beyond um, lyric uh, poetry, although there's lyric poetry in Rabbit as well. So I'm just going to say a few words about Rabbit. Um, and of course, I'd encourage all of you to sub consider submitting in future. Um, so just very quickly, Rabbit didn't start its life as a journal of non-fiction poetry. Uh, the first two issues were just open to poetry more generally. Um, but I teach creative writing in, um, at RMIT University and two of the staff there in have no doubt heard of, um, Francesca Randall Short and David Cullen. We're just setting up a research centre called the Nonfiction Lab, which has now become quite a big presence with a lot of events and activities and um, that celebrate nonfiction writing and now sort of expanded to, um, to fiction as well. And all those years ago, they asked me if I'd like to join this group and uh, what I might bring to the group. And I just said, um, how about I make Rabbit a journal for nonfiction poetry? And they said to me, what's that? And I said, let's find out. Um, so that's really the way that <laughs> Rabbit came um, to existence as a journal for nonfiction poetry. Um, but since then, Rabbit's provided a series of themes for poets to really consider um, through nonfiction poetry. So this idea of, for example, this is the geography issue, which is one of my favourites. Um, what, what happens when you think of writing about geography or geographical elements plus, um, you know, as non-fiction plus poetry or um, philosophy, philosophy plus poetry plus non-fiction, you know, what happens when these things collide? Um, personal favourites of mine, the biography issue, which was two volumes um, and the first volume was sort of more uh, poetry that poets were writing about other people, historical figures and maladies in this issue. <laughs> um, and part two was more like autobiographical. Um, there's jazz, dance, they can just hop past here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tense, that's a recent one. Oh, sport, yeah, like how do people, how might poets write about sport? Um, and I guess I'm interested and my guest editors are interested in poets thinking what can happen at the intersection of these themes and nonfiction and poetry. So for instance, what is a nonfiction sport poem? And also how might sport be conveyed through a poem's form, for instance, and not just through its content. Um, okay, and then we just had some issues that were more dedicated to demographics of poets. So we've got the youth issue, we have the indigenous issue, um, and the LGBTQIA issue. Um, and these were really interesting issues because um, submissions were from poets who identified uh, in those categories, but the poems often captured something of the demographic prompt in the theme as well, which I found really interesting. So what I love about Rabbit is this ongoing dialogue amongst all the poems in the issues. And by dialogue, I mean that there are all these different and interesting voices that are offering up interventions in conventional nonfiction writing on these themes. And what is so exciting, I think, about poetry is that it's so malleable as a form, possibly the most malleable of all forms of writing. And so when we write non-fiction through poetry, there are interesting things that can be inferred or implied through formal aspects. So in the rich poem, which I um, just described in detail, the, the small um, details of inserting spaces within her lines is just one example, I think, of um, how the, the form and the shape of the poem affects um, meaning within the poem. But there's a lot more play that a poem can employ. And just to 
throw some uh, examples from recent rabbit related works. Um, rabbit, we also publish uh, the Rabbit Poet series, which are single author collections of, um, of poetry, uh, non fiction poetry. And this one here, Meditations with Cups and Water, uh, is about the Brisbane River and follows the Brisbane River. And um, you can see it's sort of shaped uh, like the. <laughs> Um, it follows the, the bridge, uh, Brisbane River. Uh, and so you get this sense of this kind of um, fluid movement uh, in the poem, and then sometimes also blockages that are relevant to, um, as you would uh, glean from reading the poem. And just a, another example, I just opened up randomly in my office earlier today to this circular one. Um, by an American poet, Courtney Lamar Charleston, in the belonging issue of Rabbit. And this, um, this circular form uh, really sort of drives home a sense of an ongoing um, process of being chased. Um, I'm not sure who by, maybe by police, um, and this sense of being racially profiled, like this ongoing kind of cyclical kind of uh, motion uh, and the ongoing nature of that. Um, so, yes, they're sort of extreme uh, examples, I guess, but yeah, just to get you thinking about, okay, well, um, why might I want to engage with um, this real world content through a po poetic form and how can I think uh, about how form and content work together to express meaning? So yes, when I think of nonfiction poetry, I think about what poetry can do to expand the boundaries of what is accepted as non-fiction writing. But uh, I also think about length. So the short versus the long non-fiction poem or poem series. And in Rabbit, obviously due to space constraints and wanting to make room for as many voices as possible per issue, the poems usually run uh, between one and maybe three, three pages maximum, but you know, I guess they're quite short. So my focus for the rest of today's lecture is on the longer form. So uh, long poem or book length works, um, like this, this massive one here, that's all, all a big long poem. And partly that's because it's a personal fascination of mine, but also because of this idea of the sustained effort, often requiring the author these various authors here in this pile I'll go through to engage in lengthy or deep research. Um, and that's another aspect that fascinates me. So I really, um, I love these sort of efforts to, um, you know, to go to as much um, trouble in writing a historical work or a biographical work as a um, traditional um, biographer or a historian might go to. So, also this question of what poets can do with bits of information and research on their subjects. So without further ado, I'm just going to give a brief survey of some long form non-fiction poetry books. And um, I'll start with the question of um, what happens when history is told through poetry so that's, that's because my, so I've just got categories of books here. Um, so first up, I just wanted to introduce you to America, A History in Verse. This is volume one, and you can see how massive it is. Uh, there's three volumes of this, um, and there's another two volumes, and together he's released the, the, two on, the five volumes uh, on CD, CD. Um, and he's got this, 1968 as well, so that's a whole book just for that one here. Um, and 1968, this one's kind of more uh, history, lots of um, very dense on facts, but very playful as well. Um, and 1968, though, has many more memoiristic elements amongst the historical notes on this year, which was obviously. Um, a year of radical politics and protest. So the author Edward Sanders has written 
a lot of this kind of work. He's also written about this work. So there's a, an essay that you can actually download um, and find online, uh, an essay called Investigative Poetry, which he wrote in 1976. And he states that, quote, poetry to go forward has to begin a voyage into the description of historical reality, end quote. He says that, again, another quote, poetry should again assume responsibility for the description of history. So he defined investigative poetry as a style adequate to discharge, I'm quoting him again, from its, and he's a bit um, out there, uh, so <laughs> investigative poetry as a style, quote, adequate to discharge from its verse grids, the undefiled, high energy, purely distilled verse frags, I think he means fragments, using every bardic skill and meter and method of the last five or six generations in order to describe every aspect, and in brackets, no more secret governments, <laughs> of the historical present, while aiding the future, even placing Bard Babel once again into a role as shaper of the future. End quote. <laughs> so he's about, he's a bit out there and his poetry is a bit out there as well. Um, he's very playful in his history books. He uses um, glyphs, little um, pictures throughout. Uh, his poem lines make kind of wild use of space and he's got a tendency to invent words uh, through this odd sort of hyphenation. So Edward Sanders, he was very influenced by the beat poets and you can really sense that um, through his aesthetic. So this is something that I also love about these kinds of works. You really see the poet in them, situating themselves as an obvious source um, of, of that um, or like a conduit for that, that record and they're acknowledging their part in conveying this information rather than, you know, um, this differs, I think, somewhat from what you would get from a conventional history text where the facts are more or less conveyed as if they are completely accurate or the truth. So in a lot of long-form non-fiction poetry works, you frequently find that the poet's own style and voice is clearly present and there are... Um, fewer kind of illusions that the, the record might be, um, might be um, faulty. Okay, so next I have um, Geordie Alberston's Botany Bay document, which looks at the first 50 years of white settlement at Botany Bay and Port Jackson and it is told through the perspectives of numerous women, so usually uh, one poem per woman. So Augustine's research findings lead, lead her shaping of the poems, so some of which are found poems that draw on archival documents, uh, some of which take formal cues from forms like bush ballads, um, journal extracts, newspaper reports and inventory lists, uh, and she, she notes this in the preface. So the opening poem, which is entitled The Hull, is a sort of collective um, voiced poem, and it takes cues from convict songs. So I'll just read a little bit of that. The Hull. Well below sea level and sea sodden deck, we sway in our oak pod like rotten fruit. We are cut purses, housebreakers, strumpets, and whores. We are shoplifters, curse makers, footpads, and more. We've no morals or manners, but are debauched and depraved, anonymous sweepings from the old country floor. And it, it continues. So she's really creating a mood rather than just focusing on factual material. And she's referred to this book as um, documentary poetry, which brings me to my next category, which is uh, what happens when, or oh, sorry, my next question, what is, uh, what happens when documents and documentary material 
is filtered through poetic form. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, so Charles Reznikov's um, Holocaust draws from the publication Trials of War Criminals before the Nuremberg Military Tribunals under Control Council Law Number 10, of which there are 15 volumes, and the records of the Adolf Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. So he chiefly focuses on statements made by witnesses at those trials, but he withholds all the names of the criminals and of the victims and survivors. Of chief importance to Reznikov is the testimony. And interestingly, he said in an interview, quote, we read records, we read cases, we read all sorts of things, all of it written by somebody. The names are of little importance. What is important is what is said. So the, the testimony is of most importance to him. And I guess we could debate on whether or not we agree with him there about the names being of little importance. But he wants to just convey the enormity, I guess, of this, this um, horrible event. So Reznikov's style is to avoid any kind of emotional embellishment and to let the testimony speak for itself. And the effect, I think, is very haunting and very disturbing. And I remember uh, a well-known um, Melbourne poet, Pio, actually uh, loaned me um, a copy of this book many years ago and was um, telling me how affected he was by it. I remember um, how moved he was. And it definitely is the case that we readers bring emotion um, to the poems. So here's a passage, and I tried to find a passage that's not so overwhelming, um, but it's pretty hard to do so. So just a little bit of a warning. So this is the first part of section nine, which is called entertainment. So you can already tell it's gonna be a bit heavy. The commander of a camp among his amusements, as in other camps, had a large dog. And at the cry of Jude, that is Jew, the dog would attack the man and tear off pieces of flesh. In another camp, the Jews who had just come kept seeing a dog. The dog belonged to the SS man in charge of the showers, that is, the gas chambers. The SS man would call the dog Mensch, that is, man. And whenever he set the dog on a Jew, would say, man get that dog. So reading this part of the poem aloud, one might not necessarily understand the poetryness of the work. It could easily be written as prose perhaps, possibly. But there's something about the poem that makes this testimony pressurized as lines accrue. So line follows line, and the final line forcefully completes this witness statement. I think it's a careful and considered selection of images and a juxtaposition of a series of um, translations. So there's Jude, that is Jew, Mensch, that is man, but also the showers, that is the gas chambers. And that last one, I think, becomes incredibly sinister, this, um, this sort of other tongue that the Nazis used to refer to the Jews and to disguise their deeds. So in the space of the poem, suddenly these details are considered by the reader in a different way. And I think readers of poetry are more attuned to these details, um, to these juxtapositions, to these metaphors, to these repetitions, and the use of space and line breaks. Um, and then the next work of documentary poetry that I wanted to draw your attention to is Colmock Mountain Elementary by Mark Noah. And it also uses testimony and other materials, but this time to give voice to the hardworking lives of coal miners in the US and in China. So testimony is quoted verbatim from the survivors of the Sago mining disaster in West Virginia and also from people who helped to rescue those miners. And this material is printed in bold text 
set out like prose poems. So here's an example. Um, and he also draws from accounts of similar mining disasters in China, and these are set out in italics, as you can see on the other side of the page. I'm not sure where the camera goes, but... <laughs> um, and so there are also photographs that are taken by Noah himself of US miners and by a photojournalist called Ian Tay of Chinese miners. So in this sense, we see real faces that are part of the story combined with the text. And in addition to that, NOAC includes um, these bizarre exercises from the American Coal Foundation's curriculum for school children. And these are set out like instruction poems. So just to give you a visual for that, um, here you go. There's, let me see that. Oops, there. Okay. So here's an example from the instruction poem. Um, from the second lesson, cookie mining. This is so bizarre. I, yeah. <laughs> Procedure two. Explain that the mining industry, like any other business, faces challenges to make itself profitable. To understand some of these challenges, students will attempt to conduct a profitable mining business in an experiment that requires them to mine the coal chips from chocolate chip cookies. I think, I think this is actually an actual kind of um, exercise that they, they have in American schools or did. So this poem is juxtaposed with a first person account of finding a dead body after the Sago disaster. So there's something that Noack provokes through that gap between the horrific account and this absurd classroom exercise for school children. So the realities of coal mining labour um, and the disturbing ways that such industries, I think, are sold or justified to the public and to the next generation. There's this sort of tension between those things. So interestingly, on the back of the book, down at the bottom here, it's categorised as poetry slash labour history which I think is really interesting. Um, and even though the various elements of the book might ne not necessarily look like poetry, um, or what we consider po poetry to look like and to behave like, it is interesting, like I noted in relation to Reason Fox Holocaust, to think about how the label poetry makes us engage with text more carefully. At least I really hope that's what it helps readers to do. So in the case of Cold Mountain Elementary, I think the poetry sort of happens, um, in inverted commas, as much between the different elements as it does in the parts of the text. So in other words, there's a kind of frisson, I think, between the pieces and this sort of disjunct in tone between classroom exercise and the first person witness statements. This really unsettles us and makes us think about uh, what is also being unsaid, or <laughs> what is not being said. Um, so, kind of running out of time, but um, this, this is a fabulous book by C.D. Wright, um, where she visited numerous Louisiana state prisons with a photographer, Deborah Luster, um, and together they wanted to give voice to incarcerated men and women. Um, an interesting kind of question there about um, who has the right to tell stories. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, check that out. I'll just skip past that. So um, I think uh, each of the books that I've looked at so far, they offer something extra by virtue of being presented as works of poetry. Um, they have this interesting relationship to material and appropriating material, whether that's archival documents, transcripts, interviews, etc. Um, and it's yeah interesting to kind of look at uh, the different ways that poets uh, manipulate that content. So moving on, um, Another question is, what about geographical writing as poem or writing place through poetry? 
So examples I have here include um, Craig Santos Perez's from Unincorporated Territory. Uh, the first volume is Kasha. So this is the first in a series of books that the native um, Chamorro poet uh, Perez has written about his homeland, um, the Pacific island of Guam, which suffered centuries of colonisation since the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century and which is now an unincorporated territory of the United States. So Perez's focus in the book is a mix of history, family and language and, um, and looking at, I guess, the effects of colonisation on his homeland and its native peoples. He notes that in his primary school, um, the native tongue, Chamorro, was not taught which he said was a consequence of Americanization and a sustained desire to eradicate the native language. So these poems are attempts at reclaiming the island from its oppressors and making space for the silence language and stories of his people. What I find um, like really attractive about this book and what attracted to me, me to it in the first place was that there are a number of pages that sort of set out like maps uh, let me find here this sort of beautiful kind of visual mapping. And Perez, I think, is showing us different ways in which the island has been seen or understood or abused, really. Um, for example, as a military colony of the US or much earlier than that, as a stopping post for um, on the Sp Spanish galleon trade route. So this is a very fluid series of poems and um, one reviewer notes that turning each page we hear the oars of the people navigating this ocean. I think you sort of, um, yeah, just to get a sense of the, like lots of space and breath. Um, so that's, that's one book. Um, Another example is Kate Middleton's Ephemeral Waters, which follows the course of the Colorado River from its source in the Rocky Mountains um, through to the Sonora Desert. Um, it was a physical journey that Middleton made herself along all 1,500 miles of the river. And the book, the poems really exhibit her attention to the river. So watching, listening, engaging with the water and its surroundings. She says, rivers tell many histories, human and non-human, and I have barely begun to know the history and presence of this river. I have grown to love wildly. Um, so I was going to read a poem. Do I have time? Um, so this one is from a section called Interlude, this is Interlude 1, Monument Valley, Utah, Arizona. Um, and I also love how she's got these little, wait, where's my finger? <laughs> there, Monument Valley, um, she's got the little kind of facts that are these explanatory notes in the margin. This labyrinth of emptiness seems exitless as time. Here, Wayne strides beneath the breakneck heat. At night, retreats to lodge. The trading posts are brought up, manned by partisans of commerce, while that land beyond the distant messes yields more barren beasts, upholds an oath of stunning light. The emptiness is just a trick, a mirage that bites each buzzing mind that longs only to cross it. Um, so Wayne, of course, is um, John Wayne in Monument Valley, has this um, connection to John Wayne. I think a number of his films were, um, were shot there and it's become quite famous for that. Um, okay, well, I might leave that there, but um, it, it's a beautiful collection that just, yeah, follows uh, and kind of interweaves, I guess, this, this personal um, journey with the historical and the factual um, and the geographical all at once. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful work.
Um, and just because I'm, I'm speeding towards the end of this hour, uh, the final category of nonfiction poetry that I wanted to address today uh, is biographical poetry. Um, and the poems that I put in the readings for the class that will follow this lecture all relate in some way to biographical poetry, mostly. Um, and so in the three books that are published to date, which include Marionette, uh, Sweet Percy Granger and Music Made Visible, I've been fascinated by this question of what happens when you collide biography and poetry and what can poetry do that prose can't in the realm of biography writing? And how might I convey aspects of character through the form and style of the poetry in new and interesting ways? So in other words, beyond the content and the facts. So this brings me back to um, one of the first books that sparked my interest in long form biographical poetry, and that's Geordie Augustine's The Hanging of Jean Lee. Um, Jean Lee was the last woman hanged in Australia um, for a crime that she committed in uh, above a, where was it, above a shop somewhere in, near Lycan Street. So this is a really interesting book because, well, for many reasons, <laughs> um, it's set out, she uses the trope of a tabloid newspaper as a sort of structuring device influenced by the research. Um, and she divides the book into personal pages, the entertainment section, a crime supplement, and death notices. She also uses voice in really interesting ways. So uh, you, you get a sense of, um, I guess, the research impacting the voice that she chooses to use from time to time. So it's not the kind of uniform mood or tone that she uses for all of the poems, it kind of changes. So from the first poem, which is called Birth Column, there's this sort of like cheesy birth column language uh, used um, in the poem. And then in the second poem, which is called Mum's Little Helper, which is when she's four years old, there's a lot of kind of repetition and you get a real sense of uh, the, the child, um, Jean Lee, growing up. Um, and then towards the end of the collection, the poems sort of start to break down as Jean um, is arrested and she becomes hysterical after being given the death penalty. So the poetic lines become a bit more sort of frantic and confused. So um, I really love, I guess for me, this it was reading this book and I was like, oh, she's doing really interesting things with the form of the poems to help us uh, go on this kind of um, biographical journey with Jean um, and I was sort of struck by the ways that she was doing that. Um, some other examples that you might check out in your own time include um, Bloody Jack, a very uh, cheeky, playful, some might say crude um, book by Dennis Cooley, a Canadian writer. He does everything from crossword puzzles to um, letters to himself, to um, visual play, all sorts of things um, about a, a Manitoban outlaw called Jack Kravchenko. Uh, so that's a very wild volume. Interestingly, there were two books on Darwin that were released in the same year. I um, forget which year that was, but, um, and yeah, so these two on Darwin, one by Ruth Padel who is the great, I think great granddaughter, great great granddaughter of Darwin. Um, and this make, mostly makes use of found um, text. So set out like this with little bits of information in the margins that explain what's going on in the, in the poems. Like, yeah. Uh, so that's really interesting as a sort of collage of, um, of text from Darwin's notebooks and so on. Um, and then the Darwin poems by Emily Bailu is a very different read, sort of um, kind of more inhabiting maybe a, a persona of Darwin. So it's very interesting to compare those two books. Um, and 
yeah, for anyone who's interested, I wrote a chapter about those books, um, the Darwins and Flat the Jack, in a textbook called New and Experimental Approaches to Life Writing, which was edited by Joe Parnell. And also, if you're interested, at the end of that chapter, I've um, written some exercises for writers that are attempting to write biographical series of poems. So if you do those exercises, you end up, you should end up with five poems towards a kind of biographical work. Um, so I thought perhaps I'd just spend the very last little bit of this lecture talking about the why of my latest book, which is a poetic biography on the life of ballet choreographer George Balanchine. Um, Balanchine was born in Russia. Uh, he choreographed his first ballet when he was still a, a young man, a teenager. He defected in 1924, did a whole bunch of things in Europe, um, including working for the Ballet Russe with Serge Diaghilev. And eventually he settled in America in the 1930s and he co-founded the School of American Ballet and the New York City Ballet. So the reasons for my being interested in Balanchine are a story for another day. <laughs> um, but just to talk about the beginnings of this project and how I knew that it would be a biography and poetry like my last two books. But um, I guess a, a question I asked myself early on was sort of what kind of poetry um, and how would it unfold? As you can see with all the books that I've sort of tried to give you an overview of um, today, there's just so many different ways that you can approach this, um, you know, non-fiction plus poetry. Um, and yeah, thinking about how the form of the work and yeah, the shape of the poems and um, the techniques that you use are appropriate or relevant to the subject matter of your work. So I had all sorts of questions like how many sections would I have? How would the life ultimately be expressed through these poems? Um, and in part, I had to re um, immerse myself in the research to figure this out. But the Balanchine Foundation in New York City is extremely protective of their material and they have really strict copyright over Balanchine's choreography. So it's really hard to view many of his ballets without physically sitting in the New York City Public Library dance division. Um, so I went there for a couple of months, very expensive, and I watched ballets all day, every day, uh, until I felt like I was going crazy. Um, and, um, but at the end of that experience, I really could feel a lot of those dances in my bones. And I also spent some time at Harvard where Balanchine's papers were sold after his death. They're held in the Horton Library. And that's everything from like letters of correspondence, um, contracts, dance notation, photographs, musical scores, and more. So it was through that research experience that I realized this was really hammered home to me, um, that a lot of people who were really close to Balanchine all said that he was a really difficult man to know whatever that means, um, that he was extremely guarded with his private feelings and emotions, and even his many ex-wives say this, and that the closest that we might get to knowing him was really through his ballets. So this in part led me to this decision to present the biography as a sequence of Balanchine ballets. And each poem then, ballet, combines appropriate choreographical references to that particular ballet, but also with time relevant biographical elements. So what was happening in his life at that moment, um, musical gestures, um, critical assessments of the ballet and elements um, of Balanchine's life philosophy. It sounds like a lot. And obviously some of those things might not be in every poem. So, um, Another reason, I guess, for this format was that Balanchine learned from his longtime collaborator, Igor Stravinsky, who I'm sure you're prepared of, that one must not dare, sorry, one must dare not use everything in a work. That is, all the tools in one's kit, but rather demonstrate certain family relations 
when I heard that, I just thought, oh, that's so beautiful. Um, and I thought, okay, how does this translate for me? Well, I must dare not use everything and to be anxious about including all the facts, not all the tricks in poetic play, but must rather find ways in which certain combinations of poetic elements, so metaphor, breaks, space, ambiguity, juxtaposition, can do some of the work in communicating character. So, um, do I have time to read a poem? Yeah, of course. I want to read a poem, um, and alongside the poem, I'll just give some notes. Um, which one should I read? Serenade or Arziana? Maybe I'll read Arziana because it's a bit shorter. Uh, Arziana was this really strange ballet in multiple parts and it had these abrupt changes in mood between the parts. Um, it was also a ballet that went through some morphing. So initially there were six parts and then Balanchine replaced some of them and re-choreographed others. But the version that I saw had four parts, um, Central Park in the Dark, The Unanswered Question, In the Inn and In the Dark. And they were all named after musical compositions by Charles Ives, who had just died the year before the ballet was choreographed. And the ballet was choreographed in part as a kind of um, tribute to Charles Ives, the composer. Um, the music is really unsettling. It is, um, uh, it quotes from sort of popular music and um, in Central Park in the Dark, the first, um, the first movement, you can, um, it, it's almost like being in Central Park uh, at night and you hear kind of uh, like horns honking and, um, and bar music blaring from, from bars or clubs and yeah, um, this kind of cacophony. Um, and so the different parts of the ballet really sort of had this, um, this kind of eeriness and sense of, sort of isolation and detachment. And the second part of the ballet is what it's most known for. And it was choreographed for the ballerina Allegra Kent. And she doesn't touch the ground for the entire dance, but is carried by these four men who pass her around in interesting shapes. And a fifth man is kind of constantly reaching after her, but he cannot grasp her. He can't hold on to her. Um, anyway, so, um, so there's all this strange mood and strange things kind of going on. And um, then this woman who, who doesn't touch the ground, Allegra Kent. So the poem, and I just printed this out um, in colour, because in the book it doesn't appear in colour. The poem is um, set out like this with a collage in the background. And um, that's Allegra Kent's head in the middle there. And um, so while I was doing research, I discovered that um, Joseph Cornell, who was known for doing these amazing kind of collage um, shadow boxes, he had a bit of a thing for Allegra Kent and he made her a piece called Untitled Allegra Kent. And Balanchine also had a thing for Allegra Kent, but he never managed to woo her. She was like a beautiful dancer, very flexible. So <laughs> for my ballet, uh, the, the, the poem for this ballet, I decided to make a collage as well. Um, and Allegra Kent is at the centre. Um, there's a headless Emily Dickinson with a head full of Arciana. Um, there's autumn leaves from Central Park, the Twin Towers, um, Janet Reed at the bottom who played the girl who was feeling her way through the dark. Um, and uh, all of this is set against Ivan's score. Um, anyway, so I'll just read quickly and then I'll finish. May 19, 1954, Betty Cage's overtime stare. Touch liberty then know no more about America vanished into grab bag shops, cryptic and unyielding on a hot summer evening to really feel with your hands. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Night sounds in darkness for a new point of view. Anxiety for the audience in sounds of sounds. A copse, they come together polytonal. Her body discarded on a hillock. Leaves struck down. Strings stretch out the silence while the trumpets question. 
Only flutes will answer through a girl unlimited. Her hair brushes his face. There are landmarks to reach, knots to untie. He reveals his impatience. When a man suffers, even that is useful. No, no, no touch. I don't need a housewife, Whistler's mother in a rocking chair. A barn dance with a Bible is only so successful. What lasts are small, sour, insane jazz rhythms. The feet, jazz that rhythms the feet through horrid combinations. Do I impress you? The boy and girl should shake hands against the music and part ways, a New England fact. Wide open, but no escape route, and half sunken into slowness. Faint bells in the tide, subjectivity like nocturnal lights, must speak for itself. And apparently that ballet took on new significance for its sort of mood and tone um, after 9-11 as well. So this um, continued to have this sort of poetic resonances. Um, yeah. So thank you for, um, for listening. And I hope that um, through this sort of fast um, reading list that I've sparked some curiosity in potential sort of um, non-fiction poetry reading. Thank you so much, Jess. <laughs> that was great. It's beautiful to see this in colour as well. Oh, yeah, it's not in colour in the book. But yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And please join us next week, so Thursday the 10th of October. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll be speaking to Norman Erickson for Sarah Boo on Reclaiming Joy. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jess. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>